Hey, good morning, everybody. It's Paul Moore here with Wellings Capital and Bigger Pockets. And I'm so excited today because we're going to be talking about the best markets in every US region for investing in real estate. And you say, hey, Paul, how can you know the best markets in every region in the US for investing in single family and small multifamily real estate? I've got a secret. I've got a secret. And only the Bigger Pockets Premium and Pro members get access to this kind of data. So if you're not a member of the Bigger Pockets Premium or Pro Club yet, you should sign up. Hey, again, I'm Paul Moore, and I'd love to know who you are. So tell me where you're from. If you're on YouTube or Facebook, we're looking to see what you got. So hey, Jared. Hey, Clementi, Clementina. Hey, MX. Uh, Bigger Pockets. Hey. So glad you're all here, and uh, I'd love to know where you're from and what you do. But before we jump into our topic today so we can let uh, some of the millions of people who are going to be joining, I'm being sarcastic, uh, join us, I'm going to tell you again about 10 more reasons, 10 more reasons not to invest in real estate. You said, hey, this is a real estate show, I thought. Well, there's got to be some reasons not to invest in real estate, right? So. We're going to go through 10 more reasons not to invest in real estate. Hey, Shelly. Hey, Rocky. Hey, Blaze. Hey, Oren. So glad. Oh, Israel. Awesome. Okay. Southern California, you're up early. All right. Hey, Karen. All right. So 10 more reasons not to invest in real estate. You prefer, number one, you prefer the volatility of the stock market. Hashtag exhilarating, not exhilarating. Number two, you like investing in funds and the thrill of not knowing exactly where your money is going. Number three, tax deductions are for wimps. Number four, reason not to invest in real estate. You don't want any part of appreciating assets. Number five, the real estate bubble could pop at any moment, but the stock market steady and never crashes, right? Yeah. Number six, reason not to invest in real estate. You love climbing the corporate ladder and never want to stop. Number seven, financial freedom. No way. Golden handcuffs are the way to go. Number eight, being someone's landlord would make you seem older somehow. Number nine, reason not to invest in real estate. You'd rather your money go, for, go toward making someone's Super Bowl ad cooler than making someone's home safe and cleaner. And number 10, reason not to invest in real estate. Thanks to my friends at Good Egg Investments. You've done your taxes exactly the same way using TurboTax for 20 years. You don't want any newfangled investments or passive income to mess that up. Okay, 10 reasons not to invest in real estate. Hey, Judd. Hey, Tone. Hey, John from New York. Dr. Justice. Okay, so hey, Randy from Philadelphia. So we're going to jump into our presentation today, and you... What we're going to do is we're going to do about 20 minutes or less on this topic of the best markets in every U.S. region for investing in real estate. And then after that, we're going to jump into about 35 or 40 minutes of Q&A. So uh, before we hit our general topic here, I wanted to, to quickly talk about the Fear and Greed Index. So remember, the Fear and Greed Index a year and a half ago was at 89 no, actually, this was five months ago. Extreme greed, January 17th. Look at that, March 6th, it was down to six, which means people were panicking. This is to your advantage, by the way, if you're in real estate, because this fear and greed index drives stock markets up and down immediately. But you've got time, if you're in real estate, to plan, to focus, and to make moves that stock market investors would only dream of. Where's the fear and greed index today? Well, it's at 52 as of last night. So about neutral, right in the middle. Some people optimistic, some people pessimistic. Don't you wish there was one measurement tool you could use to be sure, one comprehensive number to decide whether or not a particular property in a particular region was a good investment? Well, this exact number might not exist, but the rent to price ratio can certainly help because it serves as an easy proxy for cash flow. Now, given the current economic climate, 
this is something that cash flow is something we should sure be all interested in. So the number I'm going to use today uh, is from our own Dave Meyer, our vice president of growth. Uh, and the number is RTP. RTP, which is a rent to price ratio. Here's how it's calculated. The rent to price ratio, which is in the second to the right column for these top 25 cities, is uh, it's the monthly rent times 12 divided by the purchase price. And it's expressed as a point number. It's not a percentage. So number one is Detroit, Michigan. Let's go through that. The average monthly rent is $1,116, $1, 1116 the average home price in Detroit is $35,500. By the way, that's way up from 2015. 84% uh, increase in home price from 2015. Wow, they've had some serious appreciation there. Maybe not as much as Jacksonville, but serious appreciation in five years. So that you multiply the 1116 rent times 12, divide it by the home price of 35,000, and you get a RTP in 2020 of 0.38 or 38%. You're going to be able to cash flow 38% of your home price in the first year. Of course, that doesn't include your expenses. So the RTP calculation is really, really helpful because it can show you at a glance by city, uh, if you're considering an, an investment market, you can actually start by figuring out the city. Now, there's a lot more you need to identify. You need to look at you know, whether you want to be in class B, class C, whether you want to be a landlord at all, um, what you, you, there's a lot more to dive in. But this metric will give you a very quick pass on the different cities. So we're going to break this down by region, and you're going to be a little surprised, I think, at what we're going to find out. And so let's look at some highlights, first of all. I'm going I'm to leave this slide up so you can look for a city you might be familiar with. So Detroit stayed on the top slot from 2015 to 2020, even though home prices rose 84%, rent rose a surprising 32% during that same period. So Detroit is by far the number one, beating the next closest, Birmingham, by 17%. And Detroit is, you know, like triple almost everybody on the list from Arlington, Virginia at number five on down through 25. Triple, wow. So uh, Detroit, my old hometown, is quite impressive. Now Scottsdale ranked in the bottom part of this top 25 ha despite having the highest average rent at 29.65. You know, home prices were very high there as well, 18% higher than Miami, which is the next highest average home price but the RTP ratio in Miami was not uh, not as, uh, the, R the RTP ratio was about the same, okay? So Atlanta showed the biggest positive change from 2015 to 2020. It went up 20 slots to number 18. So it was at uh, 36, no, 38, now it's 18. That means that home rentals in Atlanta went up faster than home prices. And of course, multifamily would be along, go along with home rental prices. Jacksonville, Florida had the largest drop during the five-year period. It dropped 13 slots to number 21. Why do you think that happened? Well, they had a 116% rise in home prices but only a 27% rise in rents. We're gonna talk about Jacksonville more before we're done. 22 of the top 25 performers are in mid-sized cities with population greater than 100,000 and less than a million. Okay, so a few outliers were Boca Raton, which was less than 100,000, Houston, which is over 2 million, Philadelphia, over 1.5 million, all according to the 2010 census. Now. They're not on our chart, but Orlando and Kissimmee, Florida, dropped out of the top 25 because Orlando fell 16 slots to number 40 because of home price increase of 78%, while rents rose only 30%.
Kissimmee dropped even further from number four, number four to number 30 with home prices that went up 73%. Get this, but rents that dropped 25%. Who's from Kissimmee and who can help us figure that out? What's going on there? So, all right. So we're going to break this down a little more by region. So check this out. Look at look at what jumps out of, off this graph here, this graphic. Mountain and Pacific had no cities. I don't mean mountain time zone and Pacific time zone, but the regions. Okay. So no cities in the far mountain region. That would be, you know, Idaho, Washington, California, Oregon. Uh, Southwest had Scottsdale and Houston only. Uh, jumping back to the beginning, Northeast had Detroit, Cleveland, Philadelphia, Cincinnati, New Haven, Connecticut, Columbus, and Pittsburgh. The South had this long list of cities, and seven of the southern cities were in Florida. Midwest had only four in the top 25, Kansas City, Milwaukee, St. Louis, and Oklahoma City. So if you joined us late, we're talking about the RTP ratio, the rent-to-price ratio. That's the annual rent divided by the home price. Detroit was number one by far, and Oklahoma City, still in the top 25, was the bottom of our 25 list, and it was uh, tied with a whole bunch of others, all the way from St. Louis at number 16 down to Oklahoma City at number 25, showing a respectable 9% per year ratio. Okay, so who knows the 1% rule? The 1% rule would give you a 12% ratio, okay? So who's hitting the 1% rule exactly? It would be Philadelphia, Memphis, West Palm Beach. Uh, those cities would be hitting the 1% rule on the nose. Everybody above them, the top five, are getting better than 1%. I was surprised to see Arlington, Virginia in there. 231,600 average home price? That surprises me, I have to say. So... We're going to look at maps real quick just to kind of break this down. The Northeast had these uh, eight cities. So you can look at where those are. We're going to jump back to the Northeast in a little bit. The South had a whole bunch of cities. And notice the Gold Coast down there had five cities all in a 75-mile stretch from West Palm Beach down to Miami. So the Gold Coast really lives up to its name when you look at rental properties. The Midwest had this group of four spread out, Milwaukee, Kansas City, St. Louis, and OKC. And the Southwest had Scottsdale and Houston. Like I said before, the mountain region, which this doesn't perfectly capture, uh, had none, and the Pacific region had none as well. Now, check this out. This one triangle, uh, which would be Detroit, Cincinnati, and Philadelphia did pretty well. What do you see in common there? Well, it's a 69,000 square mile region shown by this triangle. What's the, what does Detroit, Cincinnati, and Philadelphia have in common? You can think about it. It's not just sports teams. It's a good rent to price ratio. I'm just being silly. Okay, so these were the best markets in every U.S. region for investing in real estate according to this one metric. As you know, there are many other factors that going, go into deciding if you want to uh, if you want to rent, buy a rental home. And so I'm just gonna show it one more time, take a screenshot if you wish, because this is our top 25. Now, our wonderful producer, Nikki Frick, can tell us how you can get access to a weekly report that has information like this that you can't get just from going to biggerpockets.com. You have to be a premium or pro member. Now, making the jump into Bigger Pockets and then up to premium and pro, I've said it many, many times, is the number one most important thing I have ever done in my 30 two-year business career, okay? It's the number one most important thing. So if you are looking to go pro as a real estate investor, I want to see you uh, consider joining the premium and pro membership site. So Nikki has put up on the screen 
uh, where we can get this information. We're getting a weekly report from Bigger Pockets of insider tips, tricks, articles, insights, all kinds of stuff you can't just get at Bigger Pockets itself. So it's only 16 after the hour. So I have almost 45 minutes to answer questions. So Nikki Frick is our most amazing producer for this show, and she is going to be choosing questions that you have. If you had a question earlier, uh, I'd recommend that you copy and paste it in, and we're going to try to get um, we're going to try to get to it. So Tom Lore says, "Tell investors to stay away from Pittsburgh. They are driving." the prices for cheap rentals up. Interesting. Uh, thanks. I, and I actually noticed that the net population migration is down every year since 1981 in Pittsburgh. We were researching Pittsburgh last week. Jermaine Wilson says, anything that happens in Orlando, it just extends to Kissimmee. Same for Lakeland. Thanks, Jermaine. Appreciate that insight. Um, I want to talk a little bit while Nikki's getting the next question about this Gold Coast effect. So how many cities were in Florida? Like seven? Yeah, seven cities were in Florida uh, for the rent to, rent to price ratio. I personally believe, and I have not studied this to prove it. If anybody has, please let me know. I personally believe that home prices swing far more wildly than rental, than rents in places like Florida. Now we did see that Kissimmee dropped, what was it, 25% in rents and their home prices went up 34%. I've been talking about this every week on this show for probably two months. Um, I uh, think that Florida is one of the very, very best places to lose a fortune in real estate investing. Ask Rod Cleef. Rod and I are gonna be on an Atlanta a panel. Uh, we're both going to be speaking later today in Atlanta, in an Atlanta event, a real estate event. Rod, his uh, net worth went up like thirty million dollars in two thousand six, and it dropped like fifty million in two thousand seven and eight. And it was because he was investing in Florida. But if you time it right, those same losses can be turned to your gains because Florida's prices go wildly up and wildly down. And as we saw in here, I mean, what was that one? 116% price increase in Jacksonville, Florida. 116% in five years. What goes up must come down. Jacksonville's prices, if I remember right, on um, single family residential dropped 55% in the last recession. So Edward Tang says, what causes the discrepancy between rent and home prices in California, they go hand in hand. Edward, you know, I really don't know. Um, I think it's gotta be something to do with supply and demand. So uh, in Detroit, I will tell you that, okay, so I know something about Detroit. They're, they have a 71% home ownership rate, which is among the highest in America. Uh, so um, now how does that affect? You would think that that would make the rentals be in higher demand but uh, their home ownership rate is so high. Uh, Houston, by the way, Houston's in this list as well. Their home ownership rate and Dallas especially, which is not in this list, is very, very low. So I really don't know. It's got to be something to do with supply and demand. That's all I can say about that. Great question, Edward. So uh, Lorraine Marque Marquez says, I am ready to invest, but don't know where to start. I have 10,000 ready. How do I start? I'm looking for land to build my home. Should I find a rental first? Well, Lorraine, you know, I'm uh, actually a fan of holding off on building a new home right now because there is, by the time you build it, it's possible, not saying it's true, but it's possible you could be underwater. A lot of people who were building around 2007, 8 found themselves underwater in 2009 and 10. In other words, the home price value was less than they spent building it. Right now, construction prices, to my knowledge, haven't dropped. And so I would definitely focus, if it was me, all things being equal. I don't know what other situations you have, Lorraine. I don't know what you know why all the reasons you need 
um, to, you might need to have a home that you're building. Maybe you have a certain reason for that. But if you don't, I would recommend taking that 10,000 and getting into, I would buy a book by Bigger Pockets um, or Bigger Pockets Friend. Uh, it's called Real Estate on Your Terms. It's by Chris Prefontaine. And he will teach you how to do rent to own, lease to own, rent to own, lease option sandwiches, subject to deals. For $10,000, you can actually control um, possibly two or three homes or even more uh, using a lease option sandwich strategy. That's where I would start. And having a lease option sandwich, being in the middle of that sandwich actually puts you in the very, very best place of anybody to um, to weather storms, whether they're up or whether they're down. So uh, PJF says, what do you think about mixed use properties, retail with apartments? So retail, PJF took a hit of 12,000 retail stores and outlets being closed in one of the strongest economies in world history. That's 2019 in the US. And so if they're closing that fast, I would say that this coronavirus might sound the death knell for a lot of retail. I wouldn't want to be in retail. Uh, I love mixed use overall, but I wouldn't want to be in retail right now. That's what I'm thinking. So Blaze M says, Florida, a bad place to invest? I disagree. I disagree too. I must have spoken wrong. What I was saying is it's one of the best places to invest. I'm saying it's the worst place to invest at the top because they often go down, it's the best place to invest at the bottom because they go up. People from the North and Midwest wanna get out of those states, my home's on the market, and there have been eight offers with four over asking price in the first week. Hey, Blaze M, where is that? I'm, I'm curious, that's awesome. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of situations right now. So I'm at Smith Mountain Lake in Virginia, and we're seeing a lot of homes with multiple offers right now which it's something we wouldn't have really expect. I, I didn't expect this. So um, I, I don't know what is going on. We're seeing the, the things like that happening around the country. I really think that maybe, you know, I, I've been predicting on the show for months that the timing is not right to buy. This is the right time to sit tight. Ken McElroy was mentioned by somebody a minute ago. Ken McElroy thinks that same thing. He said, sit tight through 2020, watch for deals in 2021. Okay, so Chizzy Chisholm says, what's the book recommendation again? It's called Real Estate on Your Terms by Chris Prefontaine. I just finished reading it a month ago. It's got great information about subject to mortgages, lease options, sandwiches. And it looks like Cindy Gage said, uh, would you please explain the lease option sandwich? Now, folks, if you're going to take notes on anything I say, this should be it because if you're new in real estate, and even if you're not, uh, I've got friends who've been doing real estate for 20 years and they're gearing up to do a lot of these lease option sandwiches. Okay, so this would be the place to take notes, like I said. So a lease option sandwich helps four parties. It helps everybody. It helps the seller. It helps the bank. It helps the renter and the buyer. That's the same person. And it helps you and your family. It Everybody wins with a lease option sandwich. Here's how it works in summary. Let's say a seller can't sell their place and they're really desperate. They've had it on the market for a year or two and for whatever reason, it's just not selling. Maybe they need to clean it up. Maybe they need better photos. Maybe they've tried to had it overpriced, who knows? Or let's say they're about to lose it at a foreclosure sale. Okay, you jump in there and you talk to the seller and say, look, I can't buy it for cash right now, but I can take over your mortgage you need to move out. Often they've already moved. Sometimes they've relocated for a job. We'll take over your mortgage payments. If you're behind, we'll catch you up. And by the way, that's why you might need a little cash to do this, but not much. We'll catch you up, you know, a few months catch up if needed. We'll go in and clean it up, clean, clip the shrubbery, paint if we need to. Let's just say, you, you know, drop a thousand dollars on it. Then you immediately put it on a rent to own uh, you put it on a rent to own contract with a tenant buyer. Now you're in the middle of the sandwich, right? So you're paying, the, directly paying, not indirectly, but directly paying the mortgage of the seller. And you, by the way, you use a land contract to do that. Um, 
you use a land trust, I mean. I say it wrong every week, Nikki. A land trust, you put in a land trust, you pay the mortgage, the mortgage company shouldn't care, they shouldn't trigger the due on sale clause, then you're paying, and let's say you're paying that mortgage, let's say it's 800 a month. Now you go find a tenant buyer, somebody who will pay you 1,000 a month in rent, and maybe they'll pay you even 1,200 in the last 200 a month, the 1,200 of the 1,200 will go towards purchase, okay? You screen them real well, you put them in there, you give them some counseling and coaching on how to improve their credit score so they can close on the home in say three years. Now you as the lease option sandwicher get three paydays. Number one, you get a down payment. The day the tenant buyer signs, you ask them for say three, four, five, six thousand. I've seen people even get 20 or 25,000 down payment. Seriously, I saw somebody get 50,000 once and the tenant buyer even walked away from that later because they're Plans change a lot. Now, uh, you take the payday number one, which is your down payment or your lease deposit. Number two, you get paid every month because you get an, a little bit of profit margin every month on the difference between the rent from your tenant buyer and what you're paying the mortgage. And third payday and the really big home run payday is at closing. When your tenant buyer buys, you've already set a price in advance. Let's say you've set a price of 200,000, but your mortgage payoff at that time is let's say 140,000. And so you get a $60,000 payday, less the down payment they made up front, less however, however much credit they got along the way. So I'm using a real example here. We sold a house like this. We got it under contract, uh, had a mortgage of like 145. It was paid down to 140 when we sold the house three years later. We got a couple hundred dollars a month along the way, got a $10,000 deposit up front, and at closing, we sold it for 195. So that actual net proceeds at closing was actually 185 because we got 10,000 down, less the credit we gave the guy every month for three years. So that was like $7,200, 200 a month, okay? So we pocketed like $40,000, $35,000, on the day of closing. It's a great way to get into real estate, and it's going to be an incredible strategy in Florida and all kinds of other places in the coming years. That's my opinion. Can't prove it, of course. Hey, Sam S., we saw you before. Thanks for joining us again. Waiting for prices to go down before I jump into buying multifamily, but I keep hearing that as time approaches, the banks will only make it that much more difficult to borrow. That's absolutely true. What do you think? Okay, so you all need to get this book. It's by Howard Marks. It's called Mastering the Market Cycle, Getting the Odds in Your Favor. I just read it for the second time in the last couple of weeks. And the credit cycles are based on psychology. That means the lenders are just people too, and they're gonna be based on psychology just like everybody else. So credit cycles, home price cycles, uh, fear and greed cycles, they all run in parallel. And so it'll be harder to get a loan when you need the loan most. What a shame. Kev Roop says, morning, Paul. Does the land trust contract in a lease option sandwich present any risk triggering the due on sale clause of the seller's mortgage? Okay, that's a, that's a question coming from a pro right there. So Kevin Roop, Northern Virginia, one of my heroes, um, thank you, Kevin, for the question. And yes, there's a very, very small risk that it triggers the due on sale clause. Everybody I know who's done this for years or even decades has never seen it happen once. So the due on sale clause says the mortgage company can sell. They can actually call the loan due in full if the property changes hands. That's why we don't put the deed into the, uh, the the sandwicher's name, into my name if I'm doing this deal. I put it in a land trust and that should fix the problem. No guarantee it will, but it should fix the problem. Great question, Kevin. By the way, one of the things I love about the land trust while we're getting our next question here, it, excuse me, the, the lease option sandwich is you have a legal contractual right to walk away if you need to. So you tell the seller, look, I can't absolutely guarantee I'll make this payment forever. I'll, I'll start making the payment. If I don't get a, a tenant in, 
then I will not be able to keep making the payment. So let's say the whole tenant market dries up and there's no more renters. Well, you have the right to walk away, just like the tenant buyer has the right to walk away. It's an amazing place to be. And by the way, it still helps the seller and the bank because the bank doesn't want that house back. The seller might have been on, you know, they might have been in trouble underwater, lost a job, but now two and a half years later, they might be back on their feet and they might love to have that house back. I know I moved out of a house once. I wish I had back. Well, they might be too. And so it really helps everybody. And I have never figured out a single real negative to that strategy. TN Graves says, if you have inherited home paid off, is it a good time to rent it out or should you sit on the home and sell rent it after the pandemic's over? So depending on where you're located, we're seeing, and I got a, a friend, a report from a friend on my iPhone this morning, just reminding me that house price, houses are still selling. I really thought that they would start to screech into uh, sort of a um, a stall mode by now, but they're they're not. So if you want to sell it, I would get it on the market this week. Okay. However, if you want to rent it, I would go out and get the largest home equity line you can, T N Graves, and I would get that as your first mortgage. I would not get a first mortgage. Um, uh, I would not do a first mortgage any other way except through a home equity line of credit. Uh, real quick, before I go on to this next question, Mary Kirkpatrick says, do all states allow land trust? I don't know, Mary. I do know that I've heard that Texas is the only state I've heard that doesn't, that this lease option sandwich will not work. I don't know why, but Chris Prefontaine, Bigger Pockets blogger, uh, can tell you if you reach out to him or he can tell you in his book, um, Real Estate on Your Terms. Okay, next question. Let's see. Uh, T-Man Cool. T-Man Cool 24 says, what's the best way to get into real estate deal with investing partner? We both make 100000 each. What's the best way to go? So I've found that if you have somebody who has is able to full-time uh, work on the house. They go out and do all the work and you do the full-time cash. In other words, one person's a cash partner, one person's a labor partner. That works really well to split 50-50. The way we do it is the person who puts in a cash starts accruing interest at phantom interest, we call it, at 1% a month. The person putting in the labor starts accruing hours, phantom hours, at $20 an hour. Okay? At the end, when you sell the house, let's say you buy it for 100,000, fix it up and sell it for 180 and you have a $40,000 profit. Before you split the 40,000 evenly, the phantom interest is calculated and that's paid to the cash person. The phantom hours are calculated at whatever labor rate you choose, let's say $20 an hour and that's paid to the labor person. So they don't neither one of them feels ripped off and then the rest of the proceeds are split. 50-50. I did deals like that for years and I recommend it for you. Anthony Evans says, what happens if the owner dies before the tenant can buy the house in a lease option sandwich? Huh? Well, I guess the owner's heirs would still get, uh, the owner's heirs would still have the, um, the mortgage. Just like in a normal situation, Anthony, if, um, if somebody dies, their heirs are still responsible for the mortgage payments. So same thing. JM says, any ideas where to find motivated sellers interested in the sandwich option? JM, great question. Uh, Chris Prefontaine's book has a bunch of ideas on that. Um, but I would recommend that you go and look on the MLS, Zillow, whatever, and try to find houses that were on the market for one to two years and then expired. Or look for houses that were inherited and they're still empty. Or look for, in the newspaper, the day a, a pre-foreclosure, a future foreclosure hits the newspaper, jump on it right then. Go to the neighbor, go to the owner's door, stand way back from the door and say, hey, I heard you're going to lose your house on the auctions, you know, to an auction. I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm actually here to help. Would you want to hear my idea on how I can help you? And you really do help them. It's amazing. I, I love that. Uh, Cindy Gates says, if the due on sale clause doesn't happen, what happens to the tenant's deposit? If the due on sale clause doesn't happen, what happens to the tenant's deposit? So 
I'm not sure I understand the question. Uh, the tenant's deposit, you pocket the tenant's deposit. And you can use that to catch up, by the way, on the mortgage if it's behind. I'm not 100% sure what your question means. Cindy, I, I love this topic, though. Could you word it a little differently? And I'll, I'll try to answer it. Um, because the tenant's deposit is your profit, is what I'm just going to say, if that helps. Vicki, hey, Vicki Long. We were going to refi to get a better rate and pay off our HELOC. Is that a bad idea? We use the HELOC to buy our first rental. I highly recommend keeping all HELOCs open. And I highly recommend, you know, not um, not uh, getting permanent fixed mortgages because you have so much more flexibility with a HELOC. I hope I didn't rain on your parade, Vicki. It looks like you've got a nice picture in a boat there. That looks like Canada. I go fishing in Canada a lot, and that looks exactly like a lake. Uh, oh, if the due on sale does happen. Oh, Cindy, I should have read that between the lines. I'm sorry. If the due on sale clause does happen, then the tenant buyer loses. Uh, and I think, in my opinion, you should be prepared to give them back their deposit. Um, you could still, even if the due on sale clause does happen, you could still arrange a sale. If that tenant buyer has done everything you told them and got their credit score up from, let's say, 550 to 680, and they, they can do that in a year typically, they should be ready to close on that house. I think that's the answer right there. If the due on sale clause is triggered, which again, I've never heard happening, then your buyer needs to be ready to buy that house right then. And you need to put that in the contract. And then you're not liable for that deposit. However, if it absolutely doesn't work out and they lose their deposit, I think you should be ready to refund that to them out of honor. I'm not saying that's in the contract that way, but out of honor, I think you should do that because it's always right to do what's right, right? All right. Well, anyway, you get the idea. So um, Kay Lindemann says, why do you suggest to TN Graves that he or she go get a HELOC versus a conventional mortgage. I'm so glad you asked. Okay, Kay Lindemann. So you can go to, I think it's called VIP Financial Education on YouTube. That's VIP Financial Education. Or you can go to replaceyourmortgage.com. Or you can just Google the concept of paycheck parking. Paycheck parking. That's one reason. I think you should get a HELOC because you can park any money you have instead of in a half percent interest bearing bank account. You can put it against your HELOC and keep your HELOC paid down to a lower level and pay off a HELOC five times faster is what I've heard. And there's a 30 year mortgage with the same payments can be paid off in six years with a HELOC if you use the paycheck parking concept. The other reason and the big reason right now, Kay Lindemann, is that um, I think we're going to see a situation where um, we're going to uh, have many, many opportunities to buy. So if you have cash available, and that's what a HELOC does, it makes cash available without having to pay interest on it, um, you will be in a great situation when things uh, turn and when there are some deals available. And trust me, they're not there now. I think there's going to be some deals available. I don't see any way around it. Yikes, that's scary. Hey, MKG, our arm. Is that okay? What kind of animal is that? Okay. Hey there, I'm in Northern Virginia. Yay, where rents equal the PITI. So there is no cash flow. It's principal interest taxes insurance. My friend uh, break, it breaks even, pays, pays the HOA out of pocket. They say they gain equity. Okay, so basically you're saying that it's a non-cash flowing property and you're banking on appreciation. My friends, that's called speculating. If you want to speculate, go ahead. But you, I, uh, Rod Cleef, the guy I mentioned in Florida, always says you should um, not speculate. You should invest for cash flow. And he's got a whole course on that now. Uh, he's got all kinds of things that he talks about. Uh, on uh, uh, on about investing for cash flow. So you're right. You should only want cash flow. Uh, you're right that a repair will kill your equity gain. And you're asking, how do you invest in Northern Virginia for cash flow? Well, I think we saw that Arlington, at least, 
where was it? Number five on our list. And so if um, if Nikki, Nikki, if you want to show that list again, um, Arlington is number five, meaning the rent to um, the rent to purchase price ratio is surprisingly strong for Arlington, meaning you should be able to make some cash flow in Arlington. It's number five on our list with a surprisingly strong 13%. That's a little over the 1% rule. So um, if you guys want more information like this, you really should join Bigger Pockets Pro or Premium because we have all kinds of insights that are not available to the general public. You can get that at biggerpockets.com forward slash insights if you're a pro or premium member. Nikki, how can they get a pro or premium membership? So, all right. So um, it's a black wolf, says Arnab. So that's like really scary. Wow. Is that a pet? Okay. So Cindy says, thank you for this information. Someone says, yes, but a townhouse in Arlington is 800000 Yeah, I know. I know. But but the average price in Arlington, according to this, unless this is wrong, is only two thirty one six. How could the average price of a home in Arlington, Virginia, be only $231,600. I'm throwing that out to everybody, especially, you know, in um, um, especially those in Northern Virginia and DC area. Okay, so you can upgrade to a pro or premium at biggerpockets.com forward slash membership dash types. Okay, so the lease option sandwich, somebody says, is explained, it's off my screen now, in Brandon Turner's book, Paperboy Production says, um, it's very clearly explained in the book on investing in real estate with no and low money down. Okay, so I should have been recommending this all along. By the way, you should get this book, the book on investing in real estate with no and low money down because you'll be ahead of me when you do because you can see that I, I forgot that that was in there or I didn't know, I confess. And so we should remember that, Nikki, for the future to recommend Brandon's book. Brian Jordan says, what's your opinion on a first-time investor in investing in an out-of-state property? Any tips or tricks? Yeah, uh, Nikki can flash a book. There's a book on out-of-state investing in real estate by our own friend, David Green. And we recommend this book on out-of-state investing. It's full. It's chock full of information on how to invest out-of-state. And I think it will be uh, great for you to consider uh, getting that book. I don't have a lot of tips and tricks, except you really need to do incredible amount of due diligence. How do you do that? Well, you can act. Okay, there's David Green's book, Long Distance Investing by David Green at biggerpockets.com forward slash store. Great. I highly recommend this book. I do almost all my investing out of state. And I'll tell you another great book, in addition to David Green's, is our friend Brian Burke. Brian Burke was just on the Bigger Pockets podcast show a few weeks ago. I just wanted to say that, Nikki. Sorry. Am I allowed to say that? Uh, he was on there a few weeks ago, and David Burke's book is called The Hands Off Investor. And it just came out. It was the most recent book from Bigger Pockets Publishing. Sorry, I didn't give you a very good answer, but there are some resources. Okay, we're getting toward the last 15 minutes of our show. So I wanted to say it again. We uh, want to make sure that you uh, get your questions in. So if you've asked a question that hasn't been answered, copy and paste it back in. We're getting ready to wind down and enjoy our weekend. Sam S says, do you suggest buying multifamily properties from wholesalers? Yeah, you could. They usually take most of the profit out though. I mean, if they get something at 100,000 less than it's worth, they're probably gonna mark it up like 90,000 and they're gonna take the profit. You might get a little savings. Who else do you suggest buying from since finding good ones on the MLS is very challenging? Sam, I recommend waiting a year. I think 12 to 18 to 24 months from now, uh, you're going to see deals like you've never seen before since 2009 at least. So 2008, remember, I've been criticized a little bit by saying wait so long, but remember 2008 financial crisis hit home, the heart of it was with Lehman Brothers bankruptcy, September 15, 2008. That was the heart 
That was the beginning of a 15 weeks of the heart of the crisis. It took three more years, three and a half in some cases, for markets to hit bottom. Three and a half years. That's why I love real estate. Equity markets hit bottom within months. I think it was March of 09, but real estate took three years later till first quarter 2012 to hit the very bottom. S says, with the way the country is reopening, do you think there's a chance that asset prices will go way up? Some speculate hyperinflation to pay off huge debt. Well, that's another story. So great question, S. I think that there's going to be probably a downward, uh, maybe a W type of correction here. So I could actually find that, um, but I'm not going to right now. I can actually find and show you how I think this is going to correct. Uh, I'll, I'll try to find it, Nikki. Um, a W correction, so uh, a potential correction would be a, a V-shaped correction, and that is on this screen here, which means that things drop like a rock, and then they go way up real fast. Um, this isn't actually the one I wanted to show, but okay, here's a V-shaped recession, uh, and that is one possibility. Here's a U-shaped recession, and that's a way more likely possibility. Here's an L-shaped recession, and that's the last thing we all want to see. That's what Japan has experienced off and on for almost 30 years. But here's what I think is very likely, and that's a W-shaped recession. Now, I really don't know if that'll happen, but W-shaped means things go down, which they are down right now. I don't mean home prices, but I mean the economy in general. Then they have this wonderful euphoria, things go up, and then they go down again when the, the, you know, the long-term effects of the uh, economy crashing kick in. So this is a W-shaped recession. I think it's pretty likely, but of course it's a fool's game to predict the timing and the depth of this kind of thing. Now, long-term hyperinflation could kick in, especially if the US dollar is no longer the reserve currency for the world. But with the reserve, with the US dollar being a reserve currency, I think we've been able to continue to kick the can down the road on hyperinflation for a long, long time. Brian Scott says, what do you think about the Orlando market buying new construction near the medical city and new train to Miami? There's a train to Miami from Orlando? I did not know that. I should know that. Uh, Orlando market is likely going to take a massive hit, um, in the coming year or two. And I'm only, I'm mainly going on the last recessions. Did you know that Florida, since my parents were young in the 1930s, Florida has had huge ups and downs in their real estate markets. And so I really do think that it's pretty likely that uh, Orlando is going to take a huge hit. I plan to buy a lease option sandwich condo in Orlando, possibly Fort Myers, possibly Sanibel Island, about one to two years from now, if I'm right. And I may not be right. Right, Kevin Roop? Okay, so Jas Raj Singh to cry says, sorry for mispronouncing your name. What is the safest profitable city to invest in the U.S.? Because I've heard Indianapolis, Kansas City, and Detroit have the highest crime rates in the U.S. Hmm. I don't know about the highest crime rates. Um, I don't really. I, I really don't know if I can pick one city. But I mean, we could go back to you know, we could go back to that list we had. I mean, the most profitable city. I mean, if you take out of the equation, the uh, and this is the list again. If you take out of the equation all the hassles of being a landlord, and there are many, many, many hassles being a landlord. Uh, this list will give you, you know, honestly, probably the most profitable cities in the US to invest in. And so take a screenshot of this list, or better yet, join Bigger Pockets Pro or Premium and you get a full breakdown on why that is the case. So all I can say is this metric is probably one of the best. So Kevin Roop says, my guess is small apartment building units converted to condo may be skewing the numbers on the average sale price in Arlington. So Kevin should know he's only 45 minutes from Arlington. Um, so you think that the condos, the small condos being sold are skewing the numbers. You know, now that I think about Arlington, I've been there many times. I actually sold a company in 2013 to a company in Arlington. They have a ton of condos. I can't even think of any houses there. 
Maybe that's the situation. It makes to total sense to me. Slim Dam, JM says, where would you find qualified and suitable tenant buyers for sandwich options? Great question. Craigslist, um, advertise using Google AdWords, Facebook Marketplace, Facebook ads. Um, get your own little website and start getting a list. Build a list of people from that jump over from Craigslist, even newspaper ads, other places. Build a list and then advertise every house you get, Jay, to that list. And you can learn that from Brandon Turner's book and from uh, Chris Prefontaine's book, Real Estate on Your Terms. Uh, Slim Dan, Cody Elliott, Cody Elliott says, what's the least percentage you would put down on a mobile home park deal with owner financing without being over leveraged? Well, Cody, oh, it's owner financed. Okay. so. You're going to want to check the debt service coverage ratio. And it's also called the DSCR or the debt coverage ratio, which is the DCR. I highly, okay, so you want to just treat it like you would a bank loan. The debt service coverage ratio is the ratio of your, your net operating income, that's your gross revenues minus operating expenses, which is the NOI, divided by your debt payments, and that's principal and interest. That margin of safety is called, uh, that margin of safety is the debt service coverage ratio. That actually dividing NOI divided by the principal interest taxes, and excuse me, principal and interest, not the taxes and insurance. That dividing that, you should be at 1.25 or higher. That's a 25% margin of safety. Now that's the bank standard. My standard is at least 50%. In other words, double the margin of safety, okay? So that's what I would do. Check out the debt service coverage ratio. Uh, my book has touches on that. There's a lot of places to learn about the DSCR or the DCR, whatever you want to call it. Matthew Cook says, according to an interview on NPR radio with Ray Dalio, Ray Dalio wrote the book Principles, and he is an amazing hedge fund. He's one of the most successful hedge fund people, if not the most successful in history. Ray Dalio himself, the expert economist, had stated, the comeback for the economy will be slow and progressive, but not sharp and quick. Yeah, I agree. Ray Dalio is a good guy to listen to. He's got all kinds of information. He's in the news all the time now. He's talking on LinkedIn. You can connect with Ray Dalio and get his regular updates to what he thinks is going on in that area. Slim Dan says, with house hacking, do you really have to live there? I don't want to. I don't have a mortgage now. Well, if you don't have a mortgage, I would highly recommend considering getting a HELOC. So even if you don't use the HELOC, you'll be ready to if you need to. Now, um, do you have to live? I guess it really wouldn't be house hacking if you didn't live there, Slim Dan. You would just be a rental. So Kui, Kuya Bibal Barsabal says, what type of due diligence did you do in your first out-of-state investing? The list is way too long to go over. I've got the list here. I mean, we check, you know, we do, I mean, just tons of due diligence. And so I don't know if that helps. That's Wellings Capital Operator Due Diligence Process. Um, I would get, I would just bottom line it for you, Kui, since we're almost out of time and say, get, um, <clears throat> spend 20 bucks or whatever it costs to get Brian Burke's book on out of state investing. Excuse me on the hands-off investor and David Green's book called Long Distance Investing from Bigger Pockets. Okay, so I'm gonna very quickly try to buzz through uh, a, a dozen more questions and we're gonna wrap it up. How much do you see cap rates moving this year, Sean? Um, I think cap rates are gonna expand starting at the end of this year, possibly in the next one to two years. Expanding cap rates means that you are going to see lower prices. Could I be wrong? Absolutely. It's a fool's errand to guess how uh, you know uh, how much and when. And even Buffett himself, Warren Buffett, doesn't do that. This is amazing stuff. Oh, how nice! Thank you, to T Man Cool Twenty Four. It's very kind of you to say that. Hey, if you like this show, uh, please share it with your friends. Please share the recording. Uh, please give us a thumbs up a like uh, on Facebook, YouTube, et cetera. So those folks will know how to rank bigger pockets material. JF says, do you see more people looking for lease option sandwiches? 
opportunities or renting over the next 12 months. Single family rentals should do pretty well during this downturn. Green Street Advisors. Yeah, Green Street Advisors says they think single family rentals will actually increase. Um, the net operating income will increase 8% from 2019 to 2022, while they say large scale multifamily will probably drop 7% from 2019 to 2022. And that's the net operating income. Time will tell. Uh, but I think there's going to be tremendous opportunities. Uh, there's going to be more lease option sandwiches available because people lose their homes. And, and there's already statistics showing people are going to lose their homes. And I think there's going to be more of a demand because people lost their homes and they don't want to live in a cramped apartment anymore and they want to get a little space. Perfect time for lease option sandwiches. I'm a fan. Aaron Yee says, would you invest in multifamily rentals in a downtown area where crime rates are high versus single family homes in the suburbs? Aaron, you're going to find that it's harder to get good property management in high crime areas, and it's going to be a huge hassle yourself. Um, so no, I would never invest in uh, high crime rate areas. No, absolutely not. Um, you can do that, but most people who do eventually stop. Ramon, hey, Ramon Romero says, I'm in Houston. We're seeing a seller's market right now. I know. Can you please comment on why with the low, low oil prices and COVID, I would expect the opposite. Well, Ramon, if you have something to sell in Houston, sell it now. I don't mean to sound like a pessimist, but Ray Dalio, uh, Warren Buffett's not talking about it, but I can pretty much read his strategy as we study him. Um, Howard Marks, lots of Ken McElroy, almost everybody believes it's going to be a buyer's market a year from now. I don't really know why it's a seller's market right now, but I agree that it is. And I think it's amazing. And maybe it's just going to be evidence that I'm wrong. Who knows? Maybe I'm wrong. Slim Dan says better to buy a fourplex or four single family houses. You can get a lot more um, economies of scale the larger you get. So I would all absolutely get a fourplex. And I think anybody who has done both would say that as well. Janice says any suggestions for good attorneys to draw up? Contracts for lease option sandwiches. No, Janice, I really don't know. I'm sorry. Um, I don't have an answer. Uh, what do you plan to invest in during the potential market collapse in 21, 22? Absolutely can answer that. I plan to continue to invest in mobile home parks and self storage, but not just at retail prices. We're going to be looking to buy from mom and pop sellers who are under distress. We can help them by selling. They still make a huge profit over what they expected. And we can have a significant margin of safety between what we pay for and what we can upgrade it to. I could give you so many examples. Even this year, uh, the fund we invested in, we invested in Beeville, Texas in a self-storage. It was $2.3 million. It just got appraised at $4.6 million, yeah, 4 million uh, 13 months later. So huge margin of safety when you buy right. And so self-storage and mobile home parks continue to do well. And we're continual, continually happy that we invest in those. Okay, I'm going to take a few more questions. Stephen Holiday says, low interest rates, government money in the mail while working at home for a full paycheck. I know. Very oh, okay. Very motivated to get out of apartments. All this means higher home prices for now. Stephen, I think you nailed it. Stephen Holiday. Better answer than me. Thank you, Stephen. That's, I've thought about this a lot. And I think that's the best answer I've heard yet. I haven't given an answer that good. So that's great. Cody Elliott says, I mean, I know a lady who was doing childcare and she's making more money now from her own employment than she was on childcare. It's pretty amazing. Cody Elliott says, as an owner of mobile home parks, have you seen any decline in rents from Corona? No, we're seeing increasing uh, waiting lists. Now, I think the rents have, have leveled off. Some of the rent increases. It's probably not a great time to increase the rent in a mobile home park. But uh, I really think that um, um, I really think that, that uh, you're going to see a leveling for a while. Cindy says, do you recommend any good books on investing in mobile homes? There is one, and I can't remember the name. If Tim Henderson is on here, hopefully he can answer that really quickly. He just told me about one. There's another one called Trailer Cash, and that's from Jamie Smith. Trailer Cash from Jamie Smith, and that's a good book on investing in mobile homes. 
And as far as investing in self-storage, Bigger Pockets is putting out a book on self-storage. It's called, um, you think I remember the name of my own book. What's it called, Nikki? Um, Storing Up Profits, Capitalize on America's Obsession with Stuff. And hopefully Nikki can find out when that's going to come out because I wrote it and I submitted it to Bigger Pockets in January for publication. I think it's going to be published this summer. Now, if anybody wants an ebook on mobile home park investing or an ebook in self store on self storage, um, then um, we uh, we can hopefully uh, you can get a hold of me to find that. So. Ping me on Bigger Pockets and I'll get you a copy of those ebooks. Okay, I'm going to answer one more question, if possible. Any metrics you use to determine ARV with a looming recession downturn? Oh, uh, that's impossible. That's where the risk is, my friends. We just don't know what's going to happen. We don't know. And since we don't know what we don't know, then we don't know how to calculate the ARV. I would just say lower than now. I mean, with a looming recession and downturn, I would look at what happened from 2006 to 2012. Calculate that drop in your town. Let's say it's 10% drop or Florida, it's like 60% drop. Calculate that drop and apply that to your current ARV. By the way, that'll kill every deal. I'm sorry. But if you want to be really, really safe, if you... If somebody insists on buying now at one of the riskiest, riskiest times in history to buy, then you either need to buy and close your eyes and hope it works out, or you should probably apply what I just said. And if you apply what I just said, you won't be buying. I'm sorry. So that's it for today. So Nikki, anything else we need to tell folks? Uh, put it up there. If you want to become a Bigger Pockets Pro or Premium member, we highly recommend that you do that. You're going to get access to all kinds of great information, tools, tips, tricks, techniques, uh, relationships, discounts, things you couldn't otherwise get. I'm sorry for any of you who didn't get to your questions. We should be here again next week at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Standard Time, 8 a.m. Yawn on the California or on the West Coast. We look forward to seeing you again. If you like this, please share it. Please give us a thumb, star, thumbs up, whatever you guys do these days. And I'm going to go out and I'm going to Gatlinburg, Tennessee to enjoy my vacation in a few hours. So thanks. Have a great week.